We're, we're going to be turning it over to Srinivas Kumar. Srinivas Kumar is the Chief Technology Officer for Mokana. Mokana, like Microsoft, is one of our partners uh, developing our solutions. Mokana deals with moving data from the edge to cloud in terms of security. So with that, uh, Srinivas, if you're ready, we are ready to go. Hey, thanks everyone. Um, uh, thanks to ABB for giving me this opportunity. I'll uh, be presenting today on the uh, a topic of digital IoT, uh, industrial IoT for the next generation of device security. So I'll start uh, with a little uh, perspective in terms of the cyberspace and uh, a chronology of uh, how things have uh, evolved over time. So when you look at uh, cyber wars, uh, cyber wars are essentially as old as the internet itself, uh, originally uh, staged with simple programs uh, that were designed to exploit vulnerabilities in operating systems and network services. Uh, interestingly, uh, 33 years ago, they landed as viruses through portable media, uh, such as floppy disks uh, for people who still remember three and a half inch uh, floppy disks, and they spread over the network as worms. So this is dating back uh, 33 years ago. And then uh, 12 years later, uh, they were referred to as complex malware. So you can see uh, how quickly uh, things uh, shift in this space. And uh, they have been, uh, they continue to evolve uh, from simple tools to uh, smart weapons. And by 2010, they acquired broadcast capabilities as botnets. And then uh, just uh, five years later in 2015, they transformed into what we know as advanced persistent threats and kill chains. So you can see the momentum uh, and the trajectory of uh, how uh, things uh, started uh, as a very simple you know, bouncing ball on a VT100 screen to something that can take down your electric grid. So that's really uh, how uh, nasty things are getting. Uh, today they are staged as uh, coordinated cyber attacks on critical infrastructure and uh, as mainstream ransomware uh, that's operated by sophisticated nation state actors with weaponized cryptography or targeting the soft core in the critical infrastructure. So it's no longer a cottage industry of high school students trying to you know, show what they can do. Malware is transforming in both the sophistication of network surveillance and lateral propagation from the DMZ to controllers, uh, sensors, actuators. And specifically when we talk about industrials, industrial brownfield and greenfield devices uh, honestly lack the cyber resilience by design and are unprepared for the emerging wave of uh, cyber attacks. And uh, this is very obvious from what you hear in the news uh, very often. Uh, so what is the root cause? Uh, hackers know how to evade uh, detection and prevention controls. Because fundamentally, IT security was designed for network traffic introspection with uh, you know, rules based firewalls, uh, threat intelligence, policy grammar based, and anomaly detection and behavior detection. And as we try to retrofit these IT countermeasures in OT, uh, that's really fundamentally flawed, in my opinion. Why? Because the vulnerabilities in devices and humans are radically different. Uh, when you look at how uh, hackers exploit uh, IT, they exploit user psychology and role-based privileges, whether it is through phishing attacks, social networking, and so on. Whereas in OT, attackers exploit blind sp spots in the supply chain and blind trust in data. So these attacks can come through data, it can come uh, through the supply chain. So uh, protecting devices requires a different mindset. Uh, it requires a horizontal platform of transitive trust and a vertical platform of uh, integrated trust all the way from a root of trust, whether it's uh, firmware, hardware, software based root of trust anchor, all the way up the stack to the line of business applications. So uh, uh, let's look at uh, you know, uh, five trends in the industry. And uh, well, from the context of cybersecurity, a digital transformation, uh, if you uh, think about it in layman's terms, uh, in the context of devices, uh, it can be summarized uh, in one sentence, literally. Uh, artificial intelligence drives machine learning for operational efficiency 
with digital privacy and data protection uh, to enable data sharing. That's literally a sentence that describes what uh, all, how all this come together uh, literally in one sentence. And if you look at it, uh, you know, these days data is the new oil, it's the new vaporware, it's the new electricity. Uh, quoting Eric Schmidt and the general paradigm of data sciences uh, this year is uh, in God we trust, but all others bring data. It's really a very data centric uh, universe. And so this is the first trend you see in uh, digital transformation as it applies to devices. The second emerging trend are zero trust uh, models, and I'm sure by now if everybody has heard of zero trust unless you miss the memo. Uh, fundamentally, this boils down to a volume, velocity and variety challenge for real time, low latency line of business applications. Uh, as you saw in uh, Mark's presentation earlier, uh, real time low latency is very critical, whether it's computer vision, uh, uh, machine learning and so on. The volume of uh, heterogeneous devices, the cryptographic keys and certificates for device identification and authentication, uh, because identification and authentication is almost the genesis of zero trust. Uh, if you don't start with that, you cannot build trust. Then there's the velocity of uh, protective measures uh, because when you deal with uh, transfer of ownership, uh, you require uh, not, not just the uh, automation for the transfer of ownership from the uh, manufacturing floor through the uh, distributors and so on. There's also a key and certificate lifecycle management because you have to rotate keys, you have to renew certificates, and this has to happen through the whole life cycle of the device. And then there is the variety of uh, cryptographic algorithms because the reality is that we are in a global and fragmented market with export and import controls. And so you require some level of abstraction and also restricted uh, key usage, uh, which uh, basically uh, you know, hardens your zero trust model. The, the third trend is building trust in the supply chain. As I said earlier, supply chain is the exploit for OT. And uh, here the attack surface is elastic. Uh, unlike IT, where you, you can define uh, a very finite attack surface within the IT fence. So the elasticity uh, introduces many blind spots all the way from the Silicon Fab Lab to the OEMs, to the device owner operators, and then to the service providers like the MSSPs and to a heterogeneous set of connected devices because in this uh, OT world, anything connects to anything. And that's what we literally call the thing. And what it means is you now need a horizontal trust chain in order to implement the promise of zero trust. And uh, so the horizontal trust chain starts from a root of trust. Uh, if it, it could be a hardware based TPM, it could be a SIM, it could be firmware and so on to a manufacturer issued initial identifier to a, a local identifier that's issued by a device owner operator. Uh, and this is basically based on the IEEE 802.1 uh, AR standard, for example. And then down to the cryptographic key usage, because when it gets to signing encryption, authentication, uh, attestation and so on, you want to implement the principle of least privilege because you don't want to have a single point of failure where a single key failure can be catastrophic. And more importantly, it requires a hosting platform and certificate authority without cloud platform or CA lock-in. So there's ease of migration and cost management with uh, virtualization. The fourth uh, trend and Mark touched on this uh, a while ago is digital twins. Uh, and this is driven by AI initiatives for you know, quality improvements, design innovation, uh, based on telemetric data sets and uh, synchronizing the state between the physical system and the virtual system. So as we get into this cyber physical uh, system and the cyber virtual system, uh, you have to worry about plugging security gaps between the twins. Um, literally think of it uh, yeah, as a quantum state of sorts, uh, if uh, the state of one changes, the other has to catch up, otherwise you no longer have a true representation. And then you also have to protect both the physical and the virtual systems because you just doubled the attack surface. Uh, attacker can attack a virtual system to get information about a physical system. So while your physical system might be inside of a fence, you have the risk of exposing the virtual system. And then you have the synchronization challenge uh, with low latency 
of the configuration and the operational state between the physical and the virtual to maintain synchronization for functional and cycle ac uh, accurate uh, equivalency. So this also means secure messaging uh, and uh, in a very uh, low latency environment. Uh, so unless you do that, you don't have a digital twin. You actually have a you know Hollywood twin, and uh, you really don't have that uh, equivalency. Uh, the fifth trend, and not necessarily in any uh, priority order, is application security by design. Because when you see the radical difference between IT and OT, uh, the mindset is that uh, device vendors need to do something to uh, protect uh, themselves. Uh, so the application hardening is required all the way from the cloud services to the edge and then down to the devices, the connected devices, because device to edge uh, and device to cloud trust is essential if you want an airtight zero trust model. And then uh, the line of business applications will have to you know, finish product uh, address compliance requirements, which is a key driver, especially with NERC, SIP, IEC. Uh, uh, standards uh, in, in the NIST 800 series. Uh, this is really one of the uh, key drivers uh, and motivations for CTOs and uh, product security architects to look at. And then there is the risk management objectives uh, in terms of privacy, protection, device authentication, uh, monitoring the health of the device, and, and most importantly, uh, remote recovery. Uh, as you see, uh, not just uh, because of the COVID scare, uh, remote recovery is really essential for uh, agility in terms of response time, timeliness uh, when there's a attack uh, on a IT uh, OT device. Uh, so fundamentally, uh, when we look at uh, what's the difference between a threat and a risk, uh, the sophistication has increased. The risks in OT ecosystems are fundamentally different from IT ecosystems uh, because the means and methods uh, employed are fundamentally different. Uh, what are how are you doing it? What are you targeting? And then based on that, uh, you have to address the uh, countermeasure. Uh, when it comes to OT, as you see at the bottom uh, of the screen, the, the nature of attacks uh, are aimed uh, more you know, with, uh, say, uh, uh, weaponizing cryptography, as you see in uh, ransomware attacks, uh, exploiting the gaps in supply chain provenance, uh, the absence of uh, identification and authentication and insecure communication. And as you see, the, the means are different uh, based on what type of attack you want to stage, uh, what are you targeting, and how do you address the, the risk? So uh, so there's a lot of uh, information on this slide, but fundamentally the point is that uh, you can manage risks. You cannot manage threats. The threats will always be there. They'll evolve. And so if you uh, stay on the path of uh, a threat model, then uh, you're not really addressing what is the real risk in OT, uh, industrial IoT, and the risk model in OT is based on compliance, uh, security, and, and safety considerations. Uh, each risk, uh, unlike threats, has a tangible cost and benefit metric, and that really is a key driver, right? You, you won't do anything uh, unless the benefit is um, justifiable. So uh, there are about 15 attacks listed here. Uh, that causes uh, you know, a damage uh, to the device vendors, to the operators. And so if you look at a few years, for example, uh, a factory key compromise. Uh, now that will require a device recall. It will require a truck roll to remediate, right? So that's a scenario that is not just a risk, but there's a very tangible cost. Uh, and then if you look at, uh, let's say, breaking a device. Uh, in an OT operational system, Breaking a device, uh, the, which is what ransomware uh, hackers would like to do, will cause a long term service outage, uh, giving them the means to uh, extract. Or a rootkit bootkit at attack infection that may require manual intervention with a factory reset to recover, uh, which is why you uh, see a lot of people talking about secure boot, because as you go down to that level, uh, it can be catastrophic. Uh, now, when you look at the current uh, IT, uh, paradigm of detection and prevention. Sure, the detection and prevention tools and methods uh, that hackers used, uh, they are well versed in it. Uh, and as you know, the volume of events with low signal to noise ratio today and the cost of a post breach uh, forensic uh, investigation to generate threat intelligence to share with the community. Uh, that's a strategy that is not sustainable, sustainable as you go to millions of devices geographically distributed. And no two devices look the same. So the uh, threat intelligence is going to 
be like throwing a very big net into the ocean to catch all the fish in one soup, and that's just not uh, reality. Uh, the detection methods today are based on deductive, or inductive, or uh, abductive reasoning, or Bayesian logic, and Markovian models that really are not effective against sophisticated uh, tools and methods that are in the arsenal of uh, nation state actors. And so hackers are basically always two steps ahead of expert systems. Uh, they have the first strike advantage. So that uh, kind of brings us to a, a different uh, paradigm of protection. Now, detection and prevention countermeasures do provide you know, policy and uh, rules uh, oriented grammar for visibility. So it's not that they're not essential. Uh, however, the risk controls required for protection oriented countermeasures uh, with uh, you know, tamper resistance, uh, supply chain provenance, and uh, building cryptographic enclaves on uh, the, the devices that really don't have geofencing. Uh, that's essential. Uh, why? Because um, uh, when you look at uh, risk mitigation, you do that for condition based maintenance, right? You want uh, the advantages of being able to preemptively uh, uh, patch a device, uh, remotely monitor the device, and uh, recover it remotely. So, uh, in terms of mitigation, protection becomes the more critical aspect. And with uh, when you have explicit protection controls built in, and the AI training models that you know, Mark mentioned earlier on, uh, then you have a different paradigm from the traditional SIMSAM. When you look at cost functions, uh, which basically calculate the difference between predicted and actual values. So you can help evaluate the effectiveness of the model and algorithms. So you can reduce false positives and true negatives. So that's really where a, a very uh, explicit protection control that is giving you explicit signals can make a significant difference. The IoT ecosystem is very complicated, right? The, the workflows, the underlying technologies, they require a lot of collaborative mindset, all the way from the silicon vendors to the OEMs, ODMs, device owner operators, service providers. So there's a lot of touch points. When you look at the heterogeneous nature of devices you see with these icons here, uh, that's the real world in most production environments. You've got all kinds of devices. And so there is no cyber security guardrails or outposts. The cyber protection is a mesh. And the decision intelligence for safety and security will rely heavily on the trustworthiness of the data, of the device intelligence that is harvested, because that's what is injected into an AI training model for deep learning. So as they say, garbage in, garbage out. If you are not getting true state representation from the device, then your AI models will fall. And uh, a lot of the emphasis now, as you see, uh, SimSam is evolving into, uh, and everybody is claiming AI-based uh, uh, detection. So as we go to this converged ITOD uh, ecosystem, this is the real world. Uh, this is really a, a very complex fusion of NOC and SOC and device management systems and application management systems. And uh, OT is uh, right uh, in, in the middle of all this. Uh, when you look at the perspective of a SOC operator, what they would like to see is supply chain tamper resistance. Uh, as you know, the, the attack, uh, I'll not name the vendor, but uh, attack on supply chain, uh, that uh, can hit uh, devices uh, uh, seamlessly with a blind spot uh, exploiting code signing. So if code signing itself can be compromised or vulnerable, then how can a SOC operator apply an update? So supply chain is essential uh, because you, it's a domino effect that uh, hackers are using. The device intelligence and risk indicators for remote maintenance and recovery of devices. So it's no longer about after the breach. It's really about what's happening that I need to be aware of. And then when you go down to the device management system, those the DMS operators, they are looking for authenticated device identifiers for secure onboarding. They would be very hesitant to get a camera into their network, uh, any kind of device into their network unless they can have a positive ID on it. Uh, they want to see some level of on-device protection of uh, cryptographic artifacts because unlike IT systems, they cannot apply updates to the OT devices, which are generally managed by the device uh, vendors uh, through remote access. Uh, so that creates a blind spot for uh, SOC. Then there's the secure boot sequence and uh, data dioding the operation uh, uh, because they have to put these devices uh, behind uh, firewalls and sometimes there is no firewall uh, when you put something on the street, uh, parking meter, traffic light and so on. And how do they monitor the integrity of these devices? because patch management on an OT device is more complicated. The security and safety requirements on devices 
put a lot of limitations on what a device vendor will allow you to do in the field. And so those are really the OT challenges that IT will have to adjust to. And so that's really where this uh, converged uh, cyber physical system is. So uh, that uh, pretty much uh, uh, is my presentation. Uh, I'll open the floor for questions and I can flip back to any slide if you have any specific questions. Uh, sure, I say thanks very much. First, uh, it's your for the team here. It's uh, Sri Novas lives in California, so uh, he's starting super early for us. It's very much appreciated. I guess maybe one real quick one, Sri Novas. What are you seeing in the future? What What's the next level of uh, cyber threat? Yeah, what, uh, the, two yeah, years the, down. The, well, it's going to be uh, mostly exploit in the supply chain. Uh, because that has the largest uh, staging surface. Mm. Makes right? sense. And if you can attack somebody uh, uh, through a proxy where you cannot be seen, you cannot be caught, uh, and they exploit the scale, you know, making millions of devices. So it's very easy to sneak in clones, uh, sneak in tampered devices, tampered components. Very good. So once again, Srinivas, I really, really appreciate your time. We really, really appreciate you getting up uh, extra early today. Uh, actually, I, I know I know it's not early for you, but <laughs> it's still, we do appreciate it. And uh, thanks for your time.